AMS translators, welcome to another one of our series of interviews that we're doing off the back of the MS Virtual 2020 conference. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to be joined by Kelsey Smith, joining us from the Karolinska Institute from Stockholm in Sweden. Kelsey, thanks for joining us for this interview. Um, so I guess to start with, can you maybe just uh, start by introducing yourself um, and giving us a bit of an idea in terms of your overall interests in, in MS research? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for having me on. Um, I'm really, I'm a young researcher, so it's nice to have some of my research recognized and, and, and moving forward. But I'm doing my PhD at Karolinska, as you mentioned, um, with a fabulous supervisory panel, um, Scott Montgomery among, among them, um, looking at MS epidemiology, uh, essentially. So I'm really interested in what happens before MS diagnosis and what happens afterwards. So trying to connect some of the risk factors for MS, but also risk factors for progression of MS. So um, we've been looking at a lot of different infectious exposures on, on both sides of the MS diagnosis um, and trying to pinpoint maybe what is the most critical risk period for developing MS later in life. And then looking at that more from a genetics and an environmental and a lifestyle perspective. So trying to link sort of the whole picture together is what what sort of the focus of my PhD is in in a broad sense. Yeah, fantastic. So I mean, you gave a a really great presentation at, at MS Virtual 2020, and and off the back of that, uh, I guess is why I reached out to ask you to do an interview, and and I mentioned that already uh, to the MS Translate community during um, the conference itself, and there was a lot of interest in in the sort of work that you're doing. So I know that people are going to be really interested in hearing about all the things that, that you've just described. So I guess that was the big picture. Can you give us a bit of information about one of the current projects that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, um, so one of them is looking at um, a central nervous system or CNS infections, um, and this is in collaboration with a fabulous postdoc researcher at Örebro University, um, uh, as well as um, a couple of other projects looking at urinary tract infections. Um, and one of the other ones I'm doing too is looking at spasticity after the MS diagnosis. So it's a bit of a broad range at the moment, but um, I guess the one we're going to talk about is the CNS infections, mainly in this sort of critical risk period um, before MS diagnosis. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I, I found that really interesting when you talked about it, it was something that uh, for me was, was one of the highlights of the conference in terms of something that I just sat back and went, that's, really interesting uh, but before we get to talking about the results you've got um, for the project can you give us a bit of an idea as to what the background was to that project so what what was known in the area before you started working on it what inspired um, that project absolutely um, and well known that ms starts long before you even get a diagnosis um, and and part of that has been one of my interests ms it's pretty close to home for me. Um, I have a, a close family member with MS. So I've sort of been able to see <laughs> the entire trajectory of an MS patient throughout, throughout my lifetime. And um, it always sort of struck me when I was a kid, well, why, why, did, why did they get MS? Um, what happened? And my, my supervisor, Scott, he's started to look at different um, exposures such as concussion. And then one of my PhD studies um, was looking at pneumonia. Um, and other studies too have started to try to figure out well, what, what is this critical period of MS? When does it start? Or, and what I mean by critical period is what happens before MS even starts in your life that causes MS to, uh, to begin? And is this different in different stages of your life? Um, so, so, and then coupled with you go through different periods of development in your brain, are there any different such time points along your life that when something happens to you, like a concussion or an infection, does that increase or decrease your risk of MS later on developing? So trying to pinpoint that exact time um, has, been, has been of an interest. So this is multiple different types of exposures as well as the prodrome that I think you and, and, and Helen Tremlett spoke about to try to figure out what, when is the real, the real important time that one should be looking at or trying to prevent exposures or give lifestyle advice. Um, so try to prevent or, or slow down MS onset or disease even starting or progressing. So that's sort of some of the background for this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And I guess with, with all of this stuff, we have all of these little puzzle pieces, but as you say, knowing how they fit together and knowing when they're important and how they all, all come together, um, exactly. it's still things that we're, that we're trying to work on. So, 
Um, with this project, I guess, can you tell us some of the results that you've got so far that you're able to share with us? Yeah, um, so for this CNS infections one, we're looking at a multitude of exposures, um, infectious exposures. And what I mean by exposure is whether or not you've had it or not um, uh, before your MS diagnosis to make it a true risk factor um, and trying to look outside of the prodromal period as MS has already started during this period of time. Um, and in our study, we weren't able to, Sweden has fabulous registers, so all of our studies are, are based on registry-based data in which um, people's data on their hospital diagnoses, whether you stayed overnight or if you've just been there for the day, um, as well as Sweden collects massive amounts of information um, about where you live, when you're born, what region you've lived in, your prescriptions, etc. So we tried to identify people who had been diagnosed with central nervous system infections um, in childhood and adolescence and classify them in childhood and adolescence. So before age 10 years um, for childhood and 10 years to 20 years for adolescence. Um, and the, the key point here is that it happened before your MS diagnosis. And what we found um, when we even looked at other types of infections, such as viral, bacterial, um, just infections overall, that there was a difference between this childhood period of time and your adolescence period of time in which adolescence seems to be a critical period, meaning that your risk of MS increases if you've had one of these infections in your adolescence rather than in your childhood. Um, and this increased almost nearly for central nervous system infections specifically nearly 100%. So your MS risk was 100% um, increased compared to a person who didn't have a central nervous system infection. Um, and this was similar across other studies that we've done with pneumonia, where we were able to further refine this sort of age period down to 11 to 15 years of age, where you also had an increased risk of a mass after having a pneumonia diagnosis, um, as compared to someone who hasn't had a pneumonia diagnosis. And similarly with concussion, same, the same sort of time frame. So there seems to be a difference between child, childhood and adolescence in terms of increasing your risk of MS, which was really interesting to us. Mm. Yeah, certainly. And I, I mean, that was what stood out to me during the conference as well, is mm -hmm. that, you know, it was quite striking that mm -hmm. if you got one of these infections in the first 10 years of life, you know, no, not so much of a big deal compared to then, yeah. I mean, not, not saying that it's not so much of a big deal, but, you know, then in terms of the effect that it had on the MS risk compared to getting it in adolescence, um, it's a huge difference. So, you know, very, very interesting work. Um, I guess for people living with MS who, who will be watching um, this interview, um, obviously thinking that th this has a way to go in terms of understanding it even more, but what are the potential outcomes uh, for people for, with this type of research? That's always a good question because it's always nice to try to relate it back to um, people with MS um, themselves and trying to understand, well, if it's hard to prevent a central nervous system infection, but if you can then be aware post central nervous system infection of what an increased risk might be, or is this actually um, a true risk factor for MS? Because this is only one study, it needs to be reconfirmed um, in, in, in a different population. Um, is this something that can be looked at to help predict whether someone might get MS? And is it something that in combination with other lifestyle and risk factors that we know about, could this be something that helps to not have MS be diagnosed later or, or stop it or have earlier treatment or something that we can interfere on in a person's life that will decrease the risk of having MS later in life. But for current MS patients, um, they're also more at risk of infections. And much research has been shown that if you have an infection of any kind, it increases risks of relapse, uh, increases disease severity, um, and, and sort of has this cascade effect on the person who having MS. So trying to understand when and how and can these be prevented, certain, certain types of infections, serious infections requiring hospitalizations, is this something that can be targeted to, to help people with MS? Um, and I think that it, that's a it's a lofty goal, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm always curious what 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 can we do to prevent MS? What can we do to prevent MS from from getting worse? But this one study is not unfortunately going to be able to do that. But like you mentioned, with all the puzzle pieces, I think that's what what's great about MS research. Um, and 
being able to see sort of ectrams and ectrams, how many thousands of researchers are working on the same thing. So I hope that I've, our, our work has been able to maybe inspire somebody else's work to, to look into some of the mechanisms to see what's happening. Um, and so that, that would be sort of the hope. Hmm? Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure that I, I know that the, your talk did have a, a really good response. So I'm sure that it will have, have done that. And I think what's really interesting about your work in terms of, and you know, you've, you've highlighted it really well during this interview is that you're looking at these factors, both in terms of how do they increase the risk of developing MS, but also how does it impact on progression? And I think that's a really interesting question because often we just look at how does it increase the risk of developing, but then we don't think about how they might might go on further down. And as you say, yeah. you know, your two lofty goals are can we, does this have an impact on maybe being able to delay people getting MS, but also what could it mean for people who already have it? So yeah, no, fantastic, fantastic work. So obviously we've touched on them a little bit at the moment, um, but future directions, what are the next steps um, for your research? Yes, um, always the question I'm asking myself as a PhD student, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm quite early in my PhD process, so it feels like quite an honour to have been able to present at ECTRIAMS, and um, I've uh, recently received more some funding from the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada in order to look at exactly this disease, um, risk and disease progression, um, from, from looking more at pigmentation genes and sunlight and vitamin D, um, but also some of these infections we're also going to continue and look at with respect to MS um, progression. So for one of them, for example, um, born out of the pneumonia project as a risk factor for MS, we'd also like to incorporate that subsequently into disease progression, but also looking at urinary tract infections on both sides of the MS um, diagnosis, which we touched upon in the, in, in, in the pneumonia paper, which it didn't show any increased risk of MS um, if you had a urinary tract infection um, in either childhood or adolescence. Um, but we know that this is a, a, a large problem for people with MS having urinary tract infections and want to look at how does this affect then disease progression itself. So it's kind of a um, multi-layers <laughs> uh, of projects as, as it is because you, when, you, when you do research it's, it's great when you come up with more questions to ask from, from your own results and, and that's something I really enjoy doing is asking why <laughs> um, and trying to find out some answers to my own questions so still trying to continue the same thing but then adding a layer of genetics into it and looking at different MS susceptibility uh, genes which there's um, now over 221 of them um, genes that increase your risk for MS, which all have a really tiny effect themselves. Um, but what happens if there's more of them in a person and what happens then in combination with things such as different types of infections. So that's sort of the, the next step is trying to combine not just um, one exposure, but also your underlying susceptibility, which, which may or may not be um, a part of your own genetic makeup. Um, so that's that's sort of hopefully what's going to be going forward in the future. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly much better to to get to a stage of research where you your results help you come up with extra things to pursue rather than getting to <laughs> results and go well back to the drawing board. Uh, but it yes. sounds like you are going to be uh, very busy over the next few years uh, with all of the different things that you're looking into. Um, so I guess lastly, uh, I'm sure our community is going to watch this interview and, and be um, very interested and very excited by the work that you're doing. Uh, and we're always interested in trying to make sure that, um, you know, the, the community and the researchers are working well together. Um, so what can um, the MS community, um, people living with MS, do to support your work? <laughs> Great question. And I've had a couple of MS patients themselves ask me this. And one thing you could always do is, is donate to MS research um, due to world circumstances at the moment with COVID. A lot of uh, research and funding opportunities have sort of vanished. And that is completely understandable given, given the circumstance. But also a lot of MS societies allow you to get involved in research and sit on different committees as well to help try to pick research uh, and, and critique research that might be the most relevant for you as patients and, and people living with MS, um, which I think is, is a really cool and I think it's really neat that the MS community um, as a research community, but also for the people living with MS, that there's, there's that link 
um, between research and, and, and actual people, um, which sometimes I've, it, I think that's really important in any case. So that's one of the things I think um, is important, but also listening to some talks like this, there's so much misinformation now out there, which is sometimes really hard to wade through, but I think that's part of what is so important and really cool about what you do, Brad, is that you're trying to find maybe not always the right answers, because I think science sometimes doesn't always have the right answers, but trying to find the best answer given, given, given the opportunities we have and the data we have available, I think is always really important. Yeah, definitely. Look, and it's, it's a um, great thing to be able to get researchers like yourself um, to communicate directly with our community. Uh, we really appreciate you giving up your time to, to share your research and talk to us about it. Um, as I've said a number of times already throughout the interview, I know our community is going to um, find this chat really interesting. I think they're going to be really excited uh, by the work. So yeah, thank you very much for, for giving up your time to, to have this chat, for replying to me when I contacted you during the conference uh, and agreeing to be part of this. Um, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future because I'm sure you're going to have many more exciting results that, that our community is going to want to hear about. Fingers crossed. But sometimes negative results are good results too. So yeah, definitely. yes. All right. Thanks very much, Kelsey. Much appreciated. Thanks.